Good afternoon and welcome to ASC's Choosing Wisely webinar. Today's webinar is titled, How to Deliver the Right Patient Care at the Right Time with ASC's new Choosing Wisely app. The purpose of this webinar is to find out how the Choosing Wisely campaign is working to make sure physicians and patients are having the important conversations necessary to ensure the right care is delivered at the right time, and how ASC is contributing to this effort. They will also explore the ASCF AUC app, the newest tool designed to guide physicians to provide appropriate patient care, specifically in echocardiography. Before we get started, I have just a few housekeeping items that I would like to go over with you. First, we do encourage you to download a copy of the PDF of the PowerPoint slides associated with this presentation found in the resource section of this webinar. Next, since this is a live webinar, you do have the opportunity to have your questions answered by the speakers. To ask the speakers a question, click on the question mark icon in the left-hand toolbar and type and submit your question. You may do this at any point during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We will do our best to ensure that all questions are answered. However, this may not be possible depending upon the number of questions presented. We now also have a help tab to the right of the chat. If anyone has any technical issues, they can click on the tab to submit a ticket, as well as look over some other useful information, frequently asked questions, tech support number, etc. To complete your evaluation for this event, you must be logged in for the full event. At the end of the session, you will be automatically redirected to a new page. Once there, find the name of the session and click on the evaluation link. Complete the evaluation to provide us feedback on today's webinar. Without any further delay, let me introduce you to today's speakers, Daniel B. Wilson and Dr. Thomas and Dr. Andrew Keller. Dr. Daniel B. Wilson is Executive Vice President and COO of the ABIM Foundation. Previously, Mr. Wilson served for nearly two decades as the founding president and CEO of the Alliance of Community Health Plans, formerly the HMO Group, the nation's leading association of not-for-profit and provider-sponsored health plans. During his tenure, Mr. Wilson earned national recognition for spearheading the development of the health plan employer data and information set, convening the RX Health Value Coalition to provide independent information on the pharmaceutical industry and co-sponsoring with the American College of Physicians and the Journal of Effective Clinical Practice. Dr. James Thomas is a staff cardiologist, cardiologist at Cleveland Clinic. He is a lead scientist for ultrasound to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, and Dr. Thomas is board certified as a diplomat in the National Board of Medical Examiners, the American Board of Internal Medicine, and the Cardiovascular Subspecialty Board. Dr. Thomas has been a lecturer to more than 1,000 international and national symposia, conferences, meetings, and clinical training classes, conducted more than 100 professional or research studies. Dr. Thomas has published more than 500 peer-reviewed articles in professional journals, written seven books, and contributed more than 100 book chapters to professional medical textbooks. He has served as president of the American Society of Echocardiography and is the society's representative representative to the Choosing Wisely campaign. Dr. Keller, Dr. Andrew Keller is a board certified cardiologist specializing in echocardiography. Dr. Keller has 30 years of practice, graduating from Ohio State University. He completed his internal medicine training at Duke University and his cardiology fellowship training at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Dallas. He's an associate clinical professor of medicine at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons in New York. He is an active member of the American Society of Echocardiography, has served as the chair of ASC's Informatics Committee for over 15 years. He has co-authored all of the ASC's apps, including the very popular iASC app and the AUC app we are discussing today. Now, Mr. Wilson, I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, and thank you for having me on, and thank American Society of Echocardiology for being an active participant in the Choosing Wisely campaign and doing such great work um, in this area and developing an application that you'll hear about. I want to start with a story. I want to start with a story about um, uh, a friend of mine. Um, a friend of mine uh, turns 60 and gets a stress test uh, because her physician felt that that was the protocol. The stress test had some abnormalities, and she was ordered to have a cath, and the cath turned out normal, but she was hurt by that cath. Her, her leg was 
in great pain for several months. She actually had a burn in her chest. So um, it's an example, I think, of overuse and harm. Um, I experienced uh, three EKGs uh, because I had a detached retina um, uh, um, operation, and then I had two um, cataract operations. And in both times, I thought it was unnecessary. So did the American College of Anesthesiology, and so did the American um, 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 I can't remember who the other one is, but it will come to me. Both recommended that they, they oh, excuse me, ophthalmology, of course. And both recommended that EKGs not be done. Now, uh, you can say that EKGs are not a big expense, but if uh, the number of cataract operations goes up over time, um, it would be a great expense um, and an unnecessary one that might delay a procedure that's needed but uh, some uh, incidental finding uh, comes out from that. Now, you probably have your story. And when I go to meetings of people in healthcare, physician meetings or quality improvement uh, experts, I ask, this, I ask two questions to them. One is, have you ever seen in the last month unnecessary care? Please stand up. Keep standing if You've heard, if you've seen people who have been harmed by unnecessary care. And the next slide shows you a meeting uh, at the um, Institute, of Qual uh, Institute of Healthcare Improvement annual meeting where people are standing, almost 100% of them, when we said, have you witnessed unnecessary care that's harmed patients? Choosing Wisely campaign is focused on conversations between physicians and patients about overuse. Each medical society, each specialty society was asked to come up with five tests and procedures where the benefits did not exceed the risk of that procedure. Not absolute, but something that should be discussed. Certainly, some of these tests are, are relevant and appropriate for certain patients, but what we've seen is a broadening of indications for those tests and procedures that make them unnecessary for a given patient. The campaign is focused on the leadership of these specialty societies. The campaign focuses both on professionalism, leadership, and partnering. And what we did was partner with 60 specialty societies and with several consumer organizations headed by Consumer Reports. And the ABIM Foundation, along with the American College of Physicians Foundation and the uh, European Federation of Internal Medicine, developed the Physician Charter. What made this charter different, we think, was the notion of social justice that was related to the just distribution of finite resources. And what we thought was very important was this notion of physician stewardship, physicians being aware of the tests they order, whether they're appropriate or not appropriate, and addressing this issue of overuse. Specialty societies were given four things to think about in development of their list, four criteria, but were asked to use their existing processes to come up with the five things. We asked them to have it evidence-based, to have it frequent and high cost, potentially, to be transparent about their process and to have it under their control. This notion of just distribution of finite resources, when this document came out, was seen as being in conflict with the primacy of patient welfare. And I think it's that notion of trying to hold both resource use and quality and the, and the idea of doing what's good for the patient does have an intersection. We do think there's an intersection between quality and cost and doing no harm to patients. The problem that we have in America is related to this, to this area of overtreatment, which represents $200 billion per year. But we think what is more important is this responsibility of physicians in this arena. When this uh, 
survey was done and, and published in JAMA, Views of U.S. Physicians About Controlling Healthcare Costs, only 36% of, of the physicians, uh, practicing physicians, reported it was a major responsibility. Many of them thought it should be the trial lawyers that would solve this, or it would be the health, the health plans choosing this. And we believe that it's a major responsibility of physicians to solve the problem of overuse and appropriate use. They're in the best position to know what is indicated when, for what patient, and what setting. This campaign was based on a foundation of two efforts, one by Howard Brody, who wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine about the notion of developing five things for each specialty societies as their part in reforming uh, the healthcare system and uh, uh, contributing to the Affordable Care Act. The National Physician Alliance developed a, uh, under a grant from us, developed five things for internal medicine, family medicine, and pediatrics. We turned that around and said, I think the specialty societies should be doing this. Let's empower them. Let them lead this effort. Let them develop their own processes to come out with what they think is important. Let's begin this conversation. Let's see the specialty societies take the leadership on this one rather than being reactive to what comes uh, in the environment. Let's be proactive. So, uh, in April of 2012, nine societies came out um, with their recommendations in 45. The, the power of the messenger is a thing that really is the underpinning of this campaign. And after the nine came in, 17 came in. And after 17 came in, 30 came in for a total of 60. We didn't do this by ourselves. We wanted to have the patient and the physician as the center of this campaign and have conversations as the center of this campaign. Oftentimes, we hear from payers about what's appropriate or the government what's appropriate. What we really wanted to do is center on the patient and the physician and their relationship and their conversation about what was needed for that patient. So we connected with Consumer Reports. They developed a partnership with over 14 organizations, including AARP and Wikipedia. Um, Wikipedia is one of the um, most used source for information on healthcare, and uh, Consumer Reports contracted with a, um, a fellow, uh, a Wikipedia fellow, to go in and do annotations to uh, recommenda the recommendations uh, that were um, in Choosing Wisely. Uh, the notion of meeting people where they were at were very important. The next slide uh, shows uh, Paul Revere. I won't go into that in depth, but the power of, of the messenger, uh, Paul Revere being an important messenger. Um, Paul Revere was renowned for his information, his ability to connect with many communities. Um, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, James Dow uh, went out uh, and tried to awaken the uh, colonists for the British. The British were coming, but nobody came because they were not connected to Mr. Dow, and they, he was not a source of information. So I compare um, the specialty societies to Paul Revere. Um, incredible uh, sources of information well-respected, well-connected. Um, simplicity is a major part of, of choosing wisely. I'm sorry, I'll go back. These are what the recommendations look like. I didn't put up a ACEs, but ACE has five things listed at this. And after each explanation of what not to do, it talks about when it would be appropriate. To, uh, consumer reports develop translations that look like this, that are... Um, easy to read for patients uh, and for the conversation to focus on th these kinds of information that talks about less is not always better. 
And the cultural shift of less, less is not better, I don't think is just shared by the patient. It's also shared uh, by the physician. And we, we're trying to change the culture uh, of, of this always more is better. That's really a major focus of the campaign. We want to go from why didn't you order that test or procedure to why did you order that test and procedure. Um, the message of the campaign was very important. Uh, we talked to uh, many physicians and patients about how to frame the issue of overuse. And uh, what we found was that uh, physicians were very interested in taking care of their patients, very, uh, thank God. They were very uh, interested in their well-being, thank God. They were very interested in quality and informed and uh, shared decision-making. Um, they had less regard for thinking about societal needs, about the fact that we spend X percent of the GMP on, um, on, on health care. Um, they were less concerned about organizational responsibilities. But when you focus on harm, doing no harm, and quality and safety, you would engage physicians. And I think uh, the lessons learned from this campaign is right messenger, right message, and I think we're in the right time of transformation in healthcare. It was also important to get early endorsement, and um, Don Berwick at CMS called this uh, a game changer. Um, that was very important. I think this uh, uh, cardiologist uh, from Boise, uh, Montana, uh, really summed up the campaign well by saying that um, choosing wisely has uh, permitted us legitimize our ability uh, to have a conversation about what's necessary and to cut back on what's necessary. Um, we've had several uh, delivery systems that have used your traditional quality improvement techniques in a mountain with feedback to their physicians on, on overuse. Uh, Cedar sinai building in um, the recommendations into their EMR and clinical decision support, um, a medical center in Indianapolis, AAMC, giving the recommendations, uh, uh, the consumer report um, uh, translations through their EMR. Uh, we've had a lot of benchmarking through Fred Hutchinson uh, around the um, uh, ASCO recommendations. I could go through this. What's interesting is when you look at uh, well-designed organizations uh, that are group practice and align their payment, you still see overuse. So there's something else going on here than just the payment system um, and just the structure, and I think it has to do with clinical decision-making, uh, but uh, we won't go into that now. Um, let me uh, skip to some resource uh, that we have um, uh, with choosing wisely about how to have these conversations. Uh, this is on our, the website of ABIM Foundation under resources that provide a, a methodology about how to think about these kind of conversations. Uh, the complaint from physicians is going to take too long and they're going to get the procedure or test somewhere else. What you want to do is, if possible, do as efficiently as possible because you have a five-step technique in your head. Um, and you want to satisfy your patients so they don't go somewhere else and they feel good about what's going on. Um, you are a part of a grantee, uh, <coughs> a sub-grantee process that we've gotten through the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, excuse me, <coughs> and that's how you built your application, and we're, we're just happy to have you on board. And here are some other uh, grantees. The Society of Hospital Medicine has a competition about the best implementation I won't talk about your application, but I want to tell you uh, you're a part of my stump speech. And here is uh, Iowa that does, uh, has a multi-stakeholder approach, and you can't have a speech without some kind of funny cartoon. And I write a blog uh, on a weekly basis about the Choosing Wisely campaign. Uh, there was a recent article in the New England Journal of Medicine 
Um, I thought a balanced view. Um, I didn't think it was complementary to the specialty societies. And I think uh, today I have a blog that is in response to that. I happen to think that uh, they have been bold. I think the recommendations have addressed overutilized things that are important to uh, the healthcare system and to preventing harm and affect uh, our cost. Um, but I, I think it's balanced, and I think people are now on alert that recommendations are being scrutinized by others. Um, but I'm, I'm so delighted about your recommendations and look forward. We've had many societies who have come in with second and third recommendations. So thank you very much. I hope, and hope I have not gone over my time. Thank you. And this is uh, Dr. Jim Thomas from the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. Um, I am uh, uh, past president of the American Society of Echocardiography, and I was uh, lucky enough to be serving in that role at the time that we got involved in the Choosing Wisely campaign. So let me just uh, move through uh, my presentation a bit and, and explain to you what uh, five uh, 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 tests we have chosen to highlight as uh, potentially being unnecessary. Now, now first of all, uh, um, as uh, you've heard from Dr. Wolfson, uh, that uh, ASE joined uh, the Choosing Wisely campaign in the second wave in February 2013, officially uh, we joined, and um, we firmly uh, endorsed their um, uh, the principle of encouraging physicians, patients, and other healthcare stakeholders to think and talk about medical tests and procedures that may be unnecessary and are leading to inefficiencies in the U.S. healthcare system. Uh, I won't go over all the points that uh, Dr. Wolfson has already made, uh, but uh, to point out that uh, we think that a very key part of this is education, both of the uh, referring physician and of patients. Now, uh, among the benefits of choosing wisely, we think, are that it provides a clear and simple message that is resonating with uh, patients, providers, and policymakers, as well as payers. Uh, it potentially helps reduce duplicate and unnecessary procedures that waste healthcare resources in this country, um, and uh, it positions the physician organizations to continue to be leaders in improving healthcare. We're the ones that really know the way to solve this problem. We should be the ones working at it. Um, now, you might wonder how ASE ended up choosing these particular procedures to uh, highlight in our first round of Choosing Wisely. Well, fortunately, we had a, uh, a blueprint already available to us, and that was the appropriate use criteria. Uh, as you know, some years ago, ASE and ACC partnered together to develop uh, um, appropriate use criteria for a whole range of echo tests and a variety of uh, indications there, and uh, these uh, are generally lumped into um, appropriate, questionable, and inappropriate. Uh, so we could use those uh, lists to guide our discussions and try to pick some that we thought were particularly appropriate now. Now let's uh, consider which ones we did actually choose for our uh, uh, first round of uh, 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 procedures to highlight in the Choosing Wisely program. Uh, the first one of these is not to order follow-up or serial echocardiograms for surveillance after a finding of trace valvular regurgitation on an initial echocardiogram. I don't think I need to tell uh, any of the echocardiographers who are listening in the audience uh, that uh, just about all of us have uh, trace or mild regurgitation through one valve or the other. Every pulmonic valve I look at has a little regurgitation, uh, and most tricuspid and mitral valves have some regurgitation. And as our machines have gotten better and better, uh, we've had more and more uh, 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 trace amounts of regurgitation detectable there. Now, the second uh, uh, lesson is not to repeat echocardiograms in stable asymptomatic patients with a murmur or click where a previous exam revealed no significant pathology. Um, repeating the same, uh, repeating imaging to address the same question uh, when no pathology was, uh, was found 
um, well, is very unlikely to produce anything of value. Now, uh, let me just show you one uh, quick case that I read last week. Uh, this is a 33-year-old woman um, who uh, uh, had a systolic murmur as, uh, as heard by her primary care physician. Um, now, uh, the presence of a, a murmur that is of unknown uh, duration or uh, 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 significance is certainly an indication for an echocardiogram, um, and uh, she underwent an echocardiogram, and uh, I will just show you some of the images from that, but she had absolutely normal left ventricular size and systolic function. She had... Uh, trivial amounts of regurgitation through her mitral valve and tricuspid valve uh, with no other regurgitation detected, uh, and she had normal diastolic function. So this is a completely normal echocardiogram. When she returns to see her primary care physician next year, she will undoubtedly still have that systolic murmur, which probably is just a flow murmur through the pulmonary artery coming around the, uh, uh, the aorta in a thin-chested woman. It is uh, not appropriate to reorder the same echocardiogram. We're going to get the same normal results, and I think uh, uh, all of us in, in the echo world would agree that our resources are better uh, put to use for real indications. Now, moving on to some other, uh, um, some other uh, um, uh, tests that are overused here. Uh, avoid echocardiograms for preoperative perioperative assessment of patients with no history or symptoms of heart disease. Now, perioperative echocardiography is very appropriate to clarify signs or symptoms of cardiovascular disease or to investigate abnormal heart tests. Um, and we all know that resting left ventricular function can be an important uh, predictor of ischemic events but in patients who have no history of heart disease um, and uh, otherwise normal physical exam, uh, there really is no reason to think that an echocardiogram will give you anything of value there. Also, we should avoid using stress echocardiograms on asymptomatic patients who meet low-risk scoring criteria for coronary disease. Um, it's, it's most appropriate to perform stress echocardiograms in patients who present with suspicious symptoms for ischemic heart disease. There's very little information uh, to be gained uh, from asymptomatic individuals uh, who undergo this test. Now let's uh, um, consider just why this is. In the next slide, we can see uh, the uh, uh, impact of Bayesian analysis on uh, the likely outcome of a stress echocardiogram in a low-risk individual. Uh, Bayesian analysis teaches us that the utility of a test depends not just on its accuracy, that is, its sensitivity and specificity, but importantly, on the prevalence of disease in the population tested. Here is an extreme example, but one that I'm sure many of us have had referred to our echo lab a 25-year-old woman with atypical pain and no coronary artery disease risk factors, her likelihood of coronary artery disease is less than 1%. A test with 80% sensitivity and specificity, which is pretty good in our world today, means that a positive test has a greater than 95% chance of being a false positive. Um, and could lead to uh, situations that Dr. Wolfson mentioned of someone undergoing an unnecessary catheterization, which does carry significant risk and expense to it. And then finally, our last uh, uh, test to avoid is transesophageal echocardiography to detect cardiac sources of embolization if a source has been identified and patient management will not change. A general rule of thumb is there's no reason to do a test if it's not going to change what you do for the patient. And a test like transesophageal echo, uh, which uh, while very safe, is certainly uncomfortable for the patient and, uh, and inconvenient, uh, should not be done unless it's going to have a potential impact on what you do for the patient. Um, now, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Wolfson mentioned, uh, we are uh, one of many, many societies that have joined uh, with the Choosing Risley program. 
Um, and I won't bother reiterating all of those, except that they represent a who's who of uh, American health care. As of uh, last year, when we joined, there were 26 specialty societies uh, who had released lists with a collective membership of more than 725,000 physicians. And there's now a third wave that has come in, and I'm sure uh, there are well over a million uh, uh, physician members of these societies that are taking part in this program. We've reached millions of uh, consumers nationwide, and we've had five press releases uh, out since we uh, uh, released our list and uh, had a Consumer Reports article on echocardiogram prior to surgery. Now, Consumer Reports CEO Jim Guest is reporting that in less than a year, more than 80 million consumers have received practical advice about medical tests and treatments that are often overused or inappropriate. Now, as a lead-in to uh, uh, Dr. Keller's presentation, uh, as a participant in Choosing Wisely, ASA was eligible to apply for and was awarded a grant that the ABIM Foundation launched with funding from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. This $50,000 grant uh, supported the construction and marketing for a, three, a free Echo AUC app that uh, became available worldwide uh, this past fall. The free Choosing Wisely branded smartphone phone application is designed to assist practitioners in deciding when to use cardiovascular ultrasound, but I'll leave the uh, detailed description of this to Dr. Keller. Uh, finally, uh, uh, the American Society of Echocardiography has its uh, charitable arm, the ASE Foundation, um, and uh, they have been instrumental in developing this free uh, branded smartphone application to assist practitioners in uh, uh, choosing when it's appropriate to order cardiovascular ultrasound. ASE Foundation is promoting this application to all of our members, to echocardiography labs throughout the country, um, and uh, with a focus on ISIL accredited laboratories. All members of the ACC, uh, and uh, as well as members of the common professional uh, communities that order echocardiograms. And so with that, I uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm pleased to turn it over to uh, Dr. Keller to tell us more about this very excellent uh, app that has been developed uh, to highlight uh, appropriate use criteria. Uh, thank you, Dr. Thomas. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Andy Keller, and I appreciate the opportunity uh, from the Society to uh, talk to you a little bit today about uh, getting the app and uh, how it's used and how it was meant to be used. Um, obviously, uh, one of the design thoughts when we uh, came up with the interface for the application was to make it uh, for something for both patients and physicians, uh, an application that would be useful at the point of care, um, something that would be available to you uh, virtually anywhere. So uh, the obvious answer in 2014 is uh, a phone app, smartphone app, and or um, a pad app, a tablet app. So that these applications are available both in the tablet format, which is different, uh, and that's what you're seeing on the screen here, or the uh, iPhone app or, or Android app. So let me tell you a little bit about um, just how to get the app and how to download it. Uh, most of you will be familiar with uh, this interface. So this is my uh, screen on my um, iPad, and the red arrow basically there shows you uh, the App Store. So if you click the App Store, um, get to the next slide here, and then at the App Store, you uh, type in Echo AUC, and now uh, there are several ways to uh, get the application, but if you do type in Echo AUC, uh, two words. It'll get you right to the next page here, which is um, for the uh, iPad at least. And again, if you have an iPhone, it'll show up under iPhone apps as well. And you see the Echo AUC application on the left. Um, and there's that little cloud there that uh, the red arrow is pointing at. And if you double click that cloud or single click that cloud, you'll then go and the application will download. So um, this. Um, screen here just shows you some of the applications that I have on my 
iPad. Of course, we do have um, the other app that uh, we've designed, which um, we think is a great app, as well as the IASE app, which is up there in the upper left. But <clears throat> for today, we're going to talk about the Echo AUC app. So uh, clicking the uh, Echo AUC app opens you up to the uh, splash screen, which is here. And um, get credits and so forth, and just hit continue. And if you hit continue, and then you'll get to the main screen of the uh, Echo AUC app. So from here, um, really, you have uh, three functionalities. Uh, you can enter a diagnosis for uh, assessing its appropriateness. Um, you can see the ASC AUC document, um, or then you can see a visual understanding of the scoring system. So if we click on the view paper, um, you'll actually uh, have a copy of the AUC guidelines, which is a PDF. And you can actually uh, scroll using a standard reader uh, uh, to virtually any section of this document. Now, our application is built uh, directly off the 2011 appropriate use criteria for echocardiography. Uh, and many of the uh, features that we use are virtually identical. So uh, the next slide shows uh, the scoring system that we use. And this, again, is from the uh, ECHO AUC application. And so if you uh, click that, you'll then see the, uh, the scores that are available for appropriate, uncertain, and inappropriate. So this is a great place for talking points with your patients when they want to know, well, what does it mean to be appropriate or inappropriate, and what does that verbiage actually mean? So we've duplicated this out of the um, text of the document, and it's here for ready reference for you to review this with your, um, your patients or colleagues, or fellows, or house staff, or medical students. So now going back to the main screen, um, here we are uh, selecting a diagnosis. And for the sake of demonstration, I just selected acute setting. And if I click acute setting, then that gets me into the sub-menu of acute setting. Um, in this case, uh, I'm interested in a patient who has respiratory failure. So I click that. And then these are the two appropriate or inappropriate or potential use of echocardiography in the setting of respiratory failure. And um, in this case, we've selected someone who has respiratory failure or hypoxia of uncertain etiology. And we click that. And it shows us that that's an appropriate use. Now, what we've done for each indication, uh, we've included patient talking points so that you basically can hand the iPad uh, or tablet over to your patient. And from there, they can actually read um, in relatively lay comments why they're getting the test done. In this case, you're having an echocardiogram to help figure out why not enough oxygen is passing from your lungs into your blood. Your body needs oxygen-rich blood to work well. So that's basically um, how the application works. If you click on uh, the little icon there at the red arrow, then that brings you back to um, the uh, main page, and um, obviously then if you close out the app, um, you'll get back to your uh, home page there on your uh, iPad or iPhone. So um, that's basically uh, what I'd uh, wrap up. I would just uh, make a, just one comment that you know, appropriateness and appropriate utilization is very important and becoming more important and uh, recognized not only by payers and physicians alike, but also by ISIL. And uh, in terms of your accreditation now, this is going to be more of an important component of making sure that we accredit our laboratories um, to make sure that we're doing tests appropriately and for the right reason. So uh, that's uh, pretty much it. I think <clears throat> at this point we do have some questions. I'll open it up to the other uh, speakers there, um, and uh, we'll certainly try to answer your questions. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. Um, Actually, there's a, there's a good question here, uh, Dan, for you, uh, if you'd like, is, uh, is choosing wisely just U.S.-based? Uh, good question. Um, no, it's not. Um, there is now going to be a Choosing Wisely Canada, and they'll be calling themselves Choosing Wisely Canada with that trademark. Um, we're having incredible in interest from the Netherlands, uh, from New Zealand, from Australia, um, from Italy, from Germany, and so on. So um, I think this has gone international. And I think the reason, my hypothesis of the reason why it's important is that uh, under a government uh, single-payer system, um, the government seems to the people sometimes as heavy-handed. 
and the choosing wisely as an expression of professionalism and leadership, uh, I think, is very attractive uh, to the physician community and to the ministries of health that that see the power of of, of empowering physicians and having them lead the um, the movement around appropriateness. I just want to say I'm not a doctor. I have a master's in public health administration from the University of Michigan, but never went to uh, medical school, nor did I take chemistry outside of high school. Excellent. Um, Jim, do you want to just uh, maybe one of the other questions that we have here? Uh, you know, is um, Choosing Wisely, it's been a very successful campaign. Uh, what, what are the plans to keep it going, and, and what do you see it developing Future in the future for echocardiography? I can't answer the last one, but I can answer the first one. Um, a few things. Um, we're going to focus uh, some of our efforts uh, broadly about stewardship and medical education and training. In Choosing Wisely, we see kind of a Choosing Wisely 2.0, and part of that will be uh, having non-physicians uh, non uh, and clinicians um, come up with their own practices that they see are unnecessary. Uh, we've been approached by the American Dental Association, um, by the nurses um, and physical therapists, and um, we're beginning to think about how to uh, broaden the campaign to include them. And then I think there's a next generation of, of what we'll just call more challenging uh, recommendations, and I think we need to be in conversations uh, with uh, the specialty societies about what that means. That might mean uh, marginal benefit. Uh, that might mean things that have more variation, or it might be just looking at uh, this waste issue a little bit more deeply. Um, but we are having uh, organizations, specialty societies, continue to give us a list um, our shop is still open. Uh, we're processing um, um, more lists, and we're also being approached by uh, different medical um, uh, specialty societies. Um, I think the interesting one is uh, medical genetics, um, kind of the wave of the future. Um, they're already seeing overuse in this area and are very concerned and uh, are contemplating uh, coming into the campaign. One of the other questions that's here is uh, incorporating this into uh, a sort of a decision support system. In particular, there's uh, one uh, question about using EPIC, uh, but there's uh, uh, many uh, health information systems that are out there that are using order entry. And um, <clears throat> I do believe that uh, some of these have incorporated some decision support uh, into um, their processes, but in addition to that, uh, independent of the manufacturers for the uh, health information system, there are additional uh, third-party vendors who are developing products that overlay um, the uh, the current software, whether it's Epic or Allscripts or um, Sorian or uh, Eclipsis, and then into that overlay uh, use the current uh, guidelines from the uh, tables and then use those during the uh, order entry process. Now, the beauty of that is not only do you test for appropriate use, but the other thing you do is you test for unnecessary repetitive studies so that uh, these, uh, these systems not only look for appropriate use of echocardiography or virtually any other type of imaging or laboratory test, but then also uh, queue up um, the last test that was ordered by that physician or any physician and then asks if the uh, uh, if the physician still wants to order the test, even though one was just done, let's say, several weeks ago. So truly, that decision support system is an excellent way to uh, reduce cost and uh, reduce waste, uh, dealing not only with uh, inappropriate use, but also um, appropriate use, but uh, unnecessary use because of repetitive studies. Um, Jim, are you on the line still? Yeah, I sure am. So uh, one of the uh, other questions here um, is about any pediatric indications to be added to um, AUC uh, for pediatric echocardiography. Are you aware of any of, uh, of those uh, initiatives? 
Um, I'm not aware of any, but it's an excellent idea. And I think, you know, the, the way we have generally approached these is uh, we, we sort of picked off some low-hanging fruit for the first go-around uh, when uh, the time comes to to come up with more, uh, more procedures that we want to add to the list. Uh, I think we would approach our uh, uh, members on the pediatric and congenital uh, council uh, who are the experts in this uh, and I'm quite sure they are uh, they could give us uh, several indications that they think are overused or non indicated and we could uh, propagate those outward um, it's, uh, and I'm sure we'll have similar ones uh, in vascular ultrasound as well from our vascular colleagues so um, just uh, another question maybe uh, to you, Jim. Um, a couple questions have come up about policing or um, some sort of reaction or, or oversight uh, for inappropriate use. Um, how do you see that playing out with uh, uh, hospitals or payers or uh, maybe even ISIL um, for, uh, you know, for those uh, those areas where there's just continued overuse and uh, inappropriate use. And uh, I mean, is that something that you see in the future or is that just uh, something that we're going to really have to police ourselves? Well, I, I think that um, if we don't police it ourselves, others will figure out a way to police it for us. And um, it, it is challenging, though, because, uh, you know, these studies are requested. They're ordered by a referring physician. A patient has gone out of their way to show up at the laboratory, arrive for a test, and, um, you know, there's uh, we're in the business of doing echoes. Uh, the easiest thing in the world is just to do the echo and be done with it. Um, and uh, but so I think the the issue is the upstream education to try to get the word out um, to the uh, to the referring physicians and also to the to the patients that maybe this isn't a test that uh, is necessary because you, you feel terrible once a patient has traveled across town or even across the state uh, to get to you to say, well, there's no, re no reason to do this, this test. So I think the best way to do this is on the upstream education of which uh, choosing wisely is an excellent example here. Um, it's also uh, a number of the um, electronic medical records are having uh, AUC uh, criteria embedded in them so that the, the uh, physician, when they order a test, uh, they will at least be alerted that uh, based on the information given, the, the echo does not seem to be indicated. Uh, now, we all know there are sort of odd situations that don't fall under the um, uh, AUC guidelines, and there should always be a way to override them uh, for a test that a physician knows is is appropriate, uh, but I think sometimes it's just a matter of being reminded. Oh, this doesn't seem to be quite uh, indicated. Or did you realize the patient just had a, an echo last month, and perhaps you'd like to look at that result and not uh, order a new one? So there are a number of approaches to this. What we hope not to do is to get the patient caught in the middle here, um, but uh, uh, try to uh, do the right thing upstream. Uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, I just have a, a, just another question which often comes to mind. Um, you know, more often than not in, in our highly litigious society, uh, people are concerned about not performing uh, studies um, because of, um, you know, concern for litigation or missing something. Um, yet, um, uh, if we're asked to do things uh, appropriately, sometimes there's a discrepancy between what's being done appropriately versus what's being done for the purposes of, um, you know, managing potential litigation. How how has the ABIM um, resolved that, or in your mind, how do you get clarity in, in that very gray, murky area? Well, it, um, several specialty societies has asked us to take that on as an issue when we've resisted. So not a part of the campaign. I do have some feelings about it, um, being a kind of a student, a little bit of an observer and student of malpractice. Um, you know, there's acts of omission and there's acts of commission, and you can do harm by an act of commission um, and do harm to somebody. 
I always think it's, you know, that the court of law is, is, is a court of emotion, but I'd rather be a physician that was showing some clinical guidelines and some recommendations by specialty societies than going contra to them. And I think malpractice uh, and defensive medicine um, has as its underpinning some uh, degree of, of ability of physicians to deal with uncertainty and ambiguity. Um, and I think that's related to concern about uh, malpractice, and it gets uh, described as malpractice. Um, so those are the things I would like to talk about. Um, you know, people do get harmed by unnecessary care. We know that, and IOM reports 30,000 uh, deaths from care that was unnecessary. So, um, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, a, a legitimate concern uh, uh, malpractice, but I'm not sure what the solution is. When we've had malpractice reform, there has not been a significant decrease in overuse or in costs. Excellent. Um, so maybe what I'll do is, uh, since our time is sort of winding uh, down, I'll uh, turn this back over to Ronna Yates, who I know has some closing uh, statements for us. and. Certainly appreciate uh, the, uh, all the speakers here and, um, and uh, everyone who's joined on to uh, follow us along. So, um, Rana, take it away. Thank you. And on behalf of ASC, I would like to thank Daniel B. Wolfson, Dr. James Thomas, and Dr. Andrew Keller for their presentation this evening. And a special thanks to everyone who took the time to join us for this evening's webinar. We hope you enjoyed the experience. This concludes tonight's webinar. If you would kindly leave your web, browser, web browsers open, you'll be redirected to complete your evaluation for this webinar. A copy of the entire webinar will be available on ASC's Choosing Wisely page in the coming weeks. You can access this page at www.ascho.org slash choosing wisely. Thank you and have a wonderful evening.